Do you love spy books, movies, and TV? Then the Spyberry podcast is for you. Hello and welcome to Spyberry. I'm Matt Robenheimer, and Shane has very kindly invited me to guest host this episode. And today we're looking at the new book by Mark Edlitz called James Bond After Fleming, which is all about the continuation novels of James Bond. And we're very fortunate to have the author himself with us, Mark Edlitz. Uh, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Glad to be And here. we're also joined by two very knowledgeable Bond fans. I should call them Bond experts, really. Uh, Bill Canis and Brian McCaig. Welcome, guys. It's great to have a chance hey. to get together and discuss a very fascinating and sometimes overlooked corner of the, the whole Bond world. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, Mark, this is your third book specifically focused on Bond, uh, following The Many Lives of James Bond and The Lost Adventures of James Bond, which I know are two very highly regarded books in the Bond fan community. What was it that got you back into Bond mode for a third time around, and why the continuation novels as your subject? Uh, that's a good question. I wasn't intending to write a third Bond book. I, I figured I might have had my two shots. Uh, and I'd written another book called Movies Go Forth, which is about fourth films in movie franchises. And I was just exploring other uh, ventures. And it felt to me like the James Bond continuation novels was a subject that I could contribute to, that I could add value to someone's Bond bookshelf. It was not something that's been explored in this depth before. Uh, Nobody's written a book exclusively about every single Bond continuation novel. And there's roughly, you know, 27, 28 novels, seven novelizations. You know, there's spin off series and trilogies and Young Bonds and Money Penny Diaries. And I thought that it might be helpful for somebody, uh, for a reader who is not familiar with the Bond continuation novels to have a helpful guide, a, f a friendly hand to take them through this, uh, the, the forest of Bond continuation novels. And I was a little reluctant to write it just because the amount of reading that was required uh, was a little daunting. Uh, and so I resisted it, uh, but I felt like, eh, I'm going to do it. Yeah, I, one of the things that struck me looking at the book was the the amount of, of reading that you would have to do to produce a book like that. And w was it as simple as just reading all the books again? Or uh, was there, did you have opportunity to interview authors for, for this specifically? Or was there a lot of looking through old articles and so on? Well, so the, the, the biggest uh, vein of research was definitely reading all the continuation novels. Some of them are out of print. And that also included uh, short, stories, some of which have not been collected, some of which I didn't even know about. Uh, William Boyd wrote uh, a, a pair of short stories that were promotional in nature, uh, in which he goes back in time and interviews James Bond in 1969. So it, 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 it's, it's, the, it's a James Bond novel with a time-traveling sci-fi element in it, if, if you will, a, a short story, rather. Uh, and so during this research, I would stumble onto things and I would include them. And I would also have uh, uh, good friends and people who are very knowledgeable uh, 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 suggest different aspects of the book. For example, Br Brian, who's on this podcast we haven't heard from, suggested, hey, you know, Mark, are you going to look into how they came about? And I wasn't going to. I was just going to write about the novels themselves and respond to them and pick up different elements. I should uh, briefly do a, a little bit of a side tangent and then get back, is that the book is broken up into each each novel get its, gets its own chapter. And then each chapter is broken up into roughly three or four parts. A summary, uh, one, because I just think that's helpful. There's so many works out there that it's hard to keep them all straight. Uh, it also, the first part also includes, uh, you know, how Bond had his eggs, you know, just some, some little silly things to 
to to break up the the the, the big vast chunks of writing. Uh, then is an, an area of observation where I just talk about what I think the author is trying to do, and I try to. These are not reviews of the author's work. These are responses with me advocating for why I think. What this, what this author might say, this is why you should read this book. Now, you might not like every Bond novel. You might not like every short story. But I was trying to present the case as the author might do it. Of course, you know, an, an author themselves could look at this and say, Mark, this is all rubbish. But responding to the material. And then the last bit is I wanted to reveal what each author had uh, revealed about about Bond from his personal life to his taste, to his family history, to his work methods, to his past cases. Uh, and so and so all of that, those are the different parts. So back to your question. Uh, so Bri Brian would say something like, oh, you know, how did, you got to look into how they came about. So then I would go and I'd try to find the book on uh, Anne Fleming's letters. And then Bill, uh, who's also on this podcast, said, hey, Mark, your read your, your your publication order for two books is out of whack. You put uh, what is it, Bill? What did I put first? Oh, Swiss win, lose, or die with the novelization license to kill. So when you look at when you look at uh, official websites and even the when you open up the book and you see the reading list, that that's the order. Uh, license to kill goes second. So I naturally assumed. If you, that it came second, because that's how all the official entities have presented it. But it turns out uh, that License to Kill came out first. And to find out that answer, it, it, you know, a lot of Bond fans came together to help me answer this question. Bill and Brian and I'm gonna, and, and John Cox of the, of the Bond book. Uh, uh, I, I think Brad Frank, uh, John Gilbert. I, you know, there's, there's all these mysteries. It doesn't sound like it would be a mystery, but how do you prove a, a publication date order of something that was so long ago? And then you start looking into the mystery of it and, well, what are the clues that could give us the publication order? And it came down to, you know, come, you know, you open up the book and it'll say coming soon and it'll mention the other book. You know, you're reading License to Kill novelization and it'll say coming soon and it'll mention the other book. Or, or there will be a review, and it'll and it'll mention the other book coming soon. So you put all these dots together, and then you also contact the publisher. And sometimes the publisher doesn't have all that information. Uh, so you uh, pulling all these bits of bits and pieces of information together to do this kind of research. And this is just for a, a, a minor thing that not a minor thing, but it, it required a lot of research just to get the chapter right, the chapter order right. Yeah, it's very interesting stuff. Um, Bill, you obviously a big fan of of Bond and obviously knowledgeable about these books. Um, what is your experience of the continuation novels? Like, how did you first did you discover them as they came out, and what has been your opinion of them over the years? Well, I discovered them right around the time I actually started reading Fleming. I became a Bond fan. I mean, it's back way back in '79 when I saw Moonraker on the big screen. <laughs> I always have a soft spot in my heart for that. But it was about a year or so later that I really started getting into James Bond. And I was in seventh grade when it actually when it started. And um, in 81 is when uh, Gardner's uh, License Renewed came out. And I wanted to get this new book. I, I tracked down some of the Fleming novels. I got some from, from the library that, I, that was near my house. Uh, and the first novel I shared was The Man with the Golden Gun. But then, like I said, when the new books, they were new. So I, wa I wanted to read this brand new James Bond book. So, License Are Nude uh, was, was massive press for it. I mean, it, it, it was, it was uh, in the newspapers, it was in magazines, uh, and I got out of the library, and I remember uh, the New York Post here in New York serialized the entire book, and there was even a, a uh, an excerpt from it published um, in Us Magazine, I remember. So, that's when I started, when I read the new Bond books as they came out, too. So and I and I love license. I love license renewed. I, I'm as a Fleming fan too. I mean, I know there are different ways of looking at Fleming versus the continuation authors, but for me, I didn't have the experience of reading Fleming all Fleming and then starting with Gardner. I didn't have that. I was I was, you know, I was twelve years old. So I mean, but so the thing is, 
Um, but I continued yeah, every, every year. I would make sure when the garden books came out, I made sure I'd go to the bookstore and get them. And I, I and, 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 and I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed them. And I, and Gardner, I think felt, felt a, um, he filled a real gap uh, between 89 and uh, you know, 90, 95, with no Bond film on the screen. The Gardner novels, aside from some of the comics, which were sporadic at the time, were the only way to get new Bond uh, every year. And I, I've always, you know, uh, think very highly of him for that. And then a few years later, uh, when Raymond Benton took over, who I actually knew uh, because I, I worked my senior thesis on college on James Bond and politics, and I was a member of the fan club, and I remember writing to the fan club, and Raymond responded with suggestions about what I could use uh, from for sources. Uh, yeah, I knew, I, so I knew him personally, so the fact that he became the author was was. Beyond thrilling. So, uh, and um, and he even actually honored me by naming me as a character in one of his novels. I'm in, I'm in the man with the red tattoo. I am the artist William Canis, who constructed this heart sculpture uh, that the, the the villain's henchman hid inside of in in, in, the, in the book. So, um, yeah. So I'm, I I again I I I've, I've enjoyed all the continuation novels. I haven't I have not read. Uh, the last two Horowitz books, and I had not read uh, Steve Cole's Young Bond books, but I've read all the others. And it's not for lack of wanting to read it's lack of time. Um, and, uh, I mean, some are stronger than others. And one thing I'll say about Mark, though, is that in his novel, he consciously, I mean, sorry, in his book, rather, he consciously avoided uh, cri criticizing the authors, he, which is great. Because a lot of, there's a lot of Bond, Timothy Dalton stinks, or, or and I don't think that, but I'm saying, they'll, 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 they'll Heavily criticize one Bond a version of Bond versus another, but Mark does not do that. He is consistently fair to everyone in the book, which I thought was very refreshing. So yeah, it's a very interesting background also to how you discovered them because it's it's very similar to my own my own way. I happened to also see Moonraker on VHS though, not in the cinema, <laughs> and I was a high school student in uh, two thousand and. The, for the first two James Bond books I came across in my library were uh, Zero Minus Ten and the novelization of Tomorrow Never Dies. So I got started with um, with Raymond Benson. Then I got into Gardner. And then I finally found a Fleming book, which also happened to be The Man with the Golden Gun. So <laughs> so I, I had a very unusual introduction to the, the sort of the timeline of the Bond novels in that way. Uh, and... As a result, I think I've also always seen the continuation novels as just part of the sort of greater fabric of the Bond literary series as a whole, rather than seeing them as Fleming and then the rest. Right. Uh, now, Brian, I've known Brian for many years on the AJB 007 discussion forum as Silhouette Man. And I've had many a, a discussion on uh, John Gard in particular on that forum. And I know you're a you're someone who's really into the minutiae of the John Gardner books. Um, how did your interest in the continuation novels kind of really develop? Well, I, sp I suppose it, like a lot of fans that weren't there the, <clears throat> for the original books, it was really through the, the films which were shown on, on UTV, which was Ulster Television here, which was the regional version of ITV. And, you know, I sort of became a fan from, from the films. I saw probably the first ones were... Love and Let Die and Goldfinger and Diamonds Are Forever, I think. And some of the, some of those were the first I saw. And then from that, um, about 1995, I think I, I bought my first, I found the first uh, vintage Fleming novels. I think it was Doctor No and You Only Have Twice. And then from that, then I started to read them. Every year I would sort of find a few and then eventually I started reading them whenever I became, you know, 13 or that sort of age, I read Moonraker, uh, and that's still my favourite novel. So from that, um, then I started to collect anything, bought any Bond books I could find, and um, I had a few of the John Gardner books, and then I found uh, Colonel Sun, and I think that Colonel Sun was the first continuation Bond I read, uh, although I hadn't all the Fleming novels at that time, so I just sort of read them as I found them. So the first few were, were Fleming, and then I maybe read Colonel Sun, and then some more Flemings, and then the John Gardner books from there. So that's kind of um, just found them in bits rather than a whole collection, you know. That, that's and um, of, uh, Mark, one of the things it. in your book, which I think is, um, is really great, is that you've also managed to bring a bit of a, a visual representation to the 
to the um, continuation novels, which we don't haven't got so much of. And one thing in particular that really stands out is the cover, um, which firstly, when I saw it, my first thought was that reminds me of the coronet paperbacks from the 90s when I was a kid with the, the way that James Bond is written across the top and the, the very colorful style. Did you have like a, a list of elements that you wanted to get on the cover? That That is all uh, Sean Longmore. I suggested that we do some sort of a, a, a pan version and he he felt passionately about doing sort of a, a gardener riff. And he, this is entirely his creation, and he put together a, a, a whole assortment of elements from the, you know, for 50 years of Bond novels, from Gardner Sab to, to Harwich's car to, to, you know, Miss Money Punny, there, there's, there's airplanes from Gardner, there's uh, 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 Greek sites from Benson. He tried to get in as many different uh, eras as he could. Uh, that was completely his idea. Th- this approach, completely his idea. Um, I, w- I would have made it much worse had he listened to me. Uh, <laughs> and then the other thing was Pat for the interior. You know, what's well, there's a lot of uh, art from advertisements. Uh, in the back, I, I I don't remember how many, but a whole bunch. But in addition to that, uh, Pat, who who illustrated a bunch of my other books, uh, il- illustrated key moments fr- from them. So the, uh, I'm trying to think of a really good one. Um, uh, so he he I, he illustrated key moments fr- from from these different books that we that we to help the reader. Uh, think about I it. thought the uh, ice water torture from Icebreaker was a particularly good one. Yeah, I see. That's a great bit of of torture that that Gardner came up with, where Bond is. So everyone wants to copy the the, the scene from Casino Royale where where Bond is beat with a carpet beater. Uh, that's the scene that everyone's going for, and Amos did a great job with the with the with the piercing through the ear and really also through the nose. Um, but uh, Gardner came up with one with where. Bond is stripped naked and dunked in, in, in freezing ice water as if he were a tea bag, you know, up and down, up and down. And so P- Pat illustrated that moment. And you like him. I have it here if you can see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's another one that he did where, where Benson has a torture where he's being shot with a laser through the eye as, as a great form of torture. So we, we try to capture a few of these, th- these moments. And then there's also one of my favorite moments in all of these novels is a Horowitz bit, which is uh, in, in where where Bond is asked, he's with Madame Sixteen, and they're just having a. a she said, "I'm going to cook you a meal," and she says, "Lay the table," you know, set out the table, and and it's this quiet moment where Bond realizes that he's he can't remember the last time he's just asked to set out a table for someone. You know, we're used to seeing Bond, he, you know, he's he's saving the day, he's shooting people, he's doing car chases. And I thought, and that's what's usually depicted in, in, in this book. But here's this quiet moment of Bond just setting up the table. Now, it's great stuff. And I liked also how it also gave some illustration to various uh, bits of technology and weaponry and vehicles that, that Bond has used through the various uh, different novels as well. Yeah. Yeah, again, that's all Pat. He'll, uh, so I'll, I'll suggest scenes, but then he'll suggest um, vehicles and weaponry because he, I think, he really loves to do that. And so it, it's one of those things where you just let the artist do their thing and say thank you. Yeah, those are always details that really stand out to me in those books. I, I think particularly people like Gardner were very keen on introducing interesting gadgets and and weapons. So so seeing those in the book really uh, make na- last nice little uh, visual. Uh, callbacks to things that I remember particularly enjoying in those books. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point about Gardner and technology is that each of these authors is working under different parameters. And and when you're reading their books, it's not completely fair to say so-and-so is not like Fleming, or this is more like a, 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 a movie than a, than a Fleming novel. Because sometimes that's the the the, there, there are marching orders. Like, for example, with Raymond Benson, 
uh, IFPU slash Glidrose said, we would like you to take the character of James Bond and, and insert him into a movie-like adventure. So that, that's what, that, that was his operating orders, and that's what he did. And if you look at his six novels, three novelizations, and two published short stories, that's, that's what he's doing. He's taking what he thinks of as the Fleming, Fleming's James Bond and putting him in these oversized adventures. Like that was his that was his marching orders. Now Horowitz is 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 working with a different era of IFP, and they don't want that at all. They want something that is uh, sort of tied to Fleming in a, in in a more direct way. So it's it's not always fair to say oh so and so does it this way and so and so does it that way. You might like one way better, and you should or you know you you know. I'm not telling fans not to judge these works. You know, you ha- read them, have an opinion, like them, don't like them, whatever. Um, but I think it's also helpful for to understand what the author is working with. What are their parameters? Because they're you not always there. Um, yeah, sorry. You mentioned uh, Ian Fleming Publications slash Glidrose there. And I think that's an important part of the story, which you go into some detail within your book, which is how the continuation novels actually began. And it's, there's a lot of interesting details, but for a sort of quick summary, could you give like a little insight into how it all started? Yes. So Ian Fleming died and they published, you know, uh, you know, they, they published, you know, the man with the golden gun after his death and then the short stories, but it's, what do we do with the character? Should we continue the character? And you have to remember that this was not Marvel era. We were not used to seeing the continuing adventures. I mean, there, there were some. It's not to say that there were not, but it wasn't part of the pop culture parlance of the time for one author to take another author's popular work and continue it. So, and particularly with Bond and Fleming, everyone always says that Bond is clearly from the heart and soul of Ian Fleming. It's his tastes, it's his likes, it's his... Uh, you know, so how and what should another author do to do it? And Am Fleming said, you know, I don't really like James Bond, but he was clearly Ian Fleming's creation. Let's not do anything. So while that was going on, there were also these other authors who were trying to publish James Bond stories without the permission of Ian, of Glidrose slash Ian Fleming publication. So they almost had to do something to protect the character. So one of the things they they did was they turned to Kingsley Amos and had him do Colonel Sun, and they simultaneously, or nearly simultaneously, uh, turned to Arthur Calder Marshall and had him do the the 003 book. So those were the first two post-Fleming books with the 003 and a half being the first of which. Amos was not the first official Bond continuation novel. It was the first adult Bond continuation novel. The 003 and a half was the first Bond continuation novel. Yeah, and that's one of the ones that I'm really going to be learning a lot from your book about, I think, because it's one that I've never come across in the flesh myself. Um, so I really know very little about it. Yeah, I mean, some of, some of these books are unfortunately out of print. Even the, the, the great Money Penny Diaries by Samantha Weinberg credited as Kate Westbrook. You can get them on Kindle, but uh, you know the the third book in particular. If you try to get a, a physical copy on eBay, you know it, it, it's quite expensive. So not all of these books are in in reach. I can't do anything about this. <laughs> then one of the one of the aspects that I found of particular interest was so Shane. Should we wait or carry on? This is a firehouse right where, by my office, so that's where the, that is. It's too, I think they're winding now. So. so one of the early, nearly Bond novels that you mentioned in, in your book is, is, of course, the Jeffrey Jenkins uh, work, Per Fine Ounce, which I've always found of particular interest as a South African reader. Um, he's, a novel, he's a novelist who, who is very popular here, and his books are everywhere in secondhand bookshops in South Africa. And I've read a, a couple of his, A Twist of Sand and A Grew of Ice, which I thought were very strong, good, hard-edged adventure thrillers. So I think 
I, I don't know um, exactly, obviously, what his Bond novel would have been like, but, but I, w I feel it's a pity that the folks at Glidrose weren't keen on it because um, having read some of his other stuff, I think he could have done a, a very interesting James Bond novel. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, a few a few pages have survived, and what have been made available to the public. You know, it's it's. It, I think it's interesting stuff. I think it's something that Bond fans would have enjoyed. Uh, one of the things that um, Anne Fleming stipulated is that the board. This she said, okay. So if you're going to do these post Fleming bonds, you can, but the entire board or slash family has to read them and give them the thumbs up or thumbs down. And in that case, they read it and they did not go forward with it. Uh, at the, uh, Peter Jensen Smith, who, who ran it for a period, uh, said that he didn't think it was, it was up to snuff. Um, but they might have been a little bit hard on the book because from what's been made available, and it, it, it's clear that it would have, I think it would have been good. And did you find any sort of insights as to why there was a long gap between Colonel Sun and uh, Christopher Wood and and Gardner after yeah, that? Yeah, it, it is it is an interesting period because not a lot happened. You know, you go from Amos Colonel Sun roughly sixty eight to license renewed eighty one uh, ish. I'm always terrible about dates off the top of my head, so someone feel free to kick me, but. And all we get, we get three things. We get three things of, of, of note, I should say. We get two Christopher Wood novelizations, uh, w which not everyone is a fan of movie novelizations, and I get that. But Christopher Wood wrote the screenplay to both, or co-wrote the screenplay to both Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker. So you've got the screenwriter novelizing his own work, which doesn't happen all that often. There's other cases, but it's, it's, it's relatively rare. Um, but you also have him saying, I'm going to write these novelizations as if Fleming wrote them. So those two works feel like Fleming versions of those movies. And then the hey. other thing you, uh, I'm sorry, Bill. I'm, like I said, they're, they're, they're exceptional. I mean, and he, and he, and he, he ties him into continuity into the Fleming books. I mean, the one difference with Drax, somehow Drax looked the same as he did in the Fleming novel. But he's he does a f phenomenal job with the two books. So, sorry, to no, not at all. Thank you. Um, absolutely agreed. And then the other thing we get in in the in the seventies is something called James Bond: The Authorized Biography of 007. and it, it goes by different titles in different countries. And that's by John Pearson, who everyone knows wrote a biography of Ian Fleming. And the concept of uh, the authorized biography of 007 is that John Pearson is a character who has been authorized to interview James Bond and get Bond's life story. So you get, you know, from Bond, from little baby Bond to Bond, you know, in, in his, in his post, you know, uh, man with the golden gun years at a very important moment of his life where he's about to do some, do something uh, to take a relationship with, with someone to the next step. And so he goes past back on all of his cases from a slightly different point of view, and you also get to find out what happened between the cases. So there's a lot go there's a lot to that novel. But it's weird. It's like it's not a it's not a typical continuation novel. It's something that sits outside, and it's not you know it's not generally thought of as canon. Although Raymond Benson refers to James Suzuki in his short story, you know, but it's something that sort of sits outside. And that's the other thing I want to say about these things is that for me as a reader, it's better to empower your authors to follow their creative muses and get these novels that don't all line up together and, and make a perfect fit. You don't, if you put all these adventures of Bond together, you will get contradictions. They don't all line up. It is not the Marvel Cinematic Universe where there's one controlling entity making sure that, you know, on the day that Captain America got his shield that this happened. No, th th these things uh, contradict each other. And Brian, I know that you are, as I said before, a big uh, fan of Gardner. Um, what do you think it is about Gardner's books which came after that then and started a whole new series 
that carried on for an extended period of time. What is it that you about those books that you think makes them unique and also perhaps makes them divisive or controversial with Bond fans? Well, I, th I think that the, fir the first approach with Amos was getting a big name author, and he was he was a fan. Um, and I suppose Raymond Benson later on was a fan and had written a book, and Amos had written a book. But with Gardner, it was based on his you know his Boise Oaks books, and then his Herbie Kruger books were more serious um, spy novels. Boise Oaks were spoof novels, um, and by, by that time he. By, by 1981, he was he was writing more serious uh, spy novels, so I think the approach was to get a thriller writer to write a thriller instead of you know a, a literary writer like Amos had been um, and like Folks would would be later on. Um, so I think part part of the success of them is that um, Gardner had a background as a, a Royal Marine. Um, and he'd been in the fleet air arm, and they had practical experience using weapons, and they'd been involved in the Second World War, and um, that, that all fed into his writing then. Um, so it, it came at a good time um, when he was asked. And then he'd all, he's also written continuation novels, the, you know, the Moriarty journals. Um, he'd, he'd written, those were continuation novels, so he, he had form and, and, and writing, um, writing about... Um, continuation series even before that. So I think those were all reasons why he, he was chosen. Um, and also, I think that the reason there weren't any novels um, really in the 70s, not no real, I, I think that's kind of the chilling effect of what Anne Fleming had, you know, the, the review she was going to do of Colonel Sun that wasn't published. Um, that kind of had an effect. And if you look, um, she died July 1981. So the, the first, the, you know, Gardner's book came out May 81. So it's possible that um, sort of her opposition was, was, wasn't was as, uh, you know, to, to the front sort of, and she was passing on, I suppose. And that's that's kind of why I think they, they came back around to wanting to do the novels again, because her, her opposite, she was quite opposed to them. Um, the Pearson book was sort of um, something he wrote himself, and then the Eon, I suppose, would have commissioned the Christopher Wood books. So I, th I think that's kind of why Gardner came along, and and, and the, you know, and the it's really they they wanted to to launch the books again then, um, and I suppose that the reason they're successful was he he got to write well. He was commissioned to write three, and then another three, and another three. And he, he kind of got to write a series, and there's not really very many people, really only him and I suppose Raymond Benson have really written a, a sort of continuous series like that, uh, where they've had you know a, a chance to go over uh, more than a handful of books. They, they've you know he, he wrote fourteen original novels and and two novelizations, film novelizations. So he he, he got a, a long time to um, expand the the literary Bond universe and. Um, experiment with the character and, you know, to deliver different types of novel, depending on the, the sort of what he wanted to do. So that's what, I think that's why he's, he's, if you exclude Gardner, you're, you're sort of excluding a large part of the, you know, the literary bond, really, because he wrote so many, contributed to so many books over 15 years. So... Yeah, I mean, I had largely overlooked Gardner when I was, when I was writing my first Bond book, The Many Lives of James Bond. I, I reached out to Brian about something, and he would always bring up John Gardner. And I and I looked through my manuscript, and I had like like literally no references to John Gardner. Um, and that first book was 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 you know sort of heavily was skewing towards the film, so that's partially an excuse. But 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 truthfully, I just sort of uh, overlooked him, as, as many Bond fans did. And and Brian is such an advocate of John Gardner that I had to start. Well, I should work him in. He did sixteen of these things. Uh, that's an that's a huge number. And could you imagine writing? What I know he had two breaks, so it wasn't once a year for the whole run, but it was essentially once a year for the whole run, except these two one year breaks. Could you imagine coming up with an entire novel and an entire Bond plot and villains and, and reversals? once a year while also writing another book i mean the guy like the you know he was a 
to call him a machine is 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 is, is not the right word what I'm looking for, but he was a a serious working writer who liked to apply his craft and and, and did so uh, frequently. Yeah, let me say about Gardner. I thought that he was terrific and that he was very contemporary. I mean, the books were certainly written at the time they were written. And given the political nature of what was going on in the 80s with, you know, President Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, Bond became a cold warrior once again. And it was very prevalent in, in those books. And also respect to Gardner, um, I remember after I read Seafire, and there was so many changes. It was, ah, oh, this is crazy. You know, I was concerned. So I actually sat down, wrote, wrote him a four-page letter uh, at care of the publisher. And he responded. Within a week, I got a response back from him addressing point by point what I said to him in my letter. So and he, he, he was, he, yeah, it was, you know, I thought he was excellent. So that's <laughs> One of the things I've always wondered about his books is if he just didn't write too many um, for, because I think readers, especially in the later ones, they started to complain a lot about some of his repetitive habits with, with his plotting and double crosses. And maybe his plots weren't, were becoming repetitive of earlier books. Do you think his, his reputation might've been better if say he'd finished after his initial run of six and then somebody fresh had taken over? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I actually wrote something about that that I ha that I haven't published yet. But that that's my that's my personal theory, just like yours, Matt. Is that is that I think if he stopped at three or four or five or six, uh, pe people would have fonder memories of him. But I, I I think that the later books also reflect more of his own personal interests. When you get to something like. Uh, never send flowers where you have Bond versus a serial killer. This is what happens when you have someone who's writing the series over uh, many novels. When you get when you're writing your one first Bond book, you know you you're making more of a statement about like your version of Ian Fleming's Bond. But when you're six, seven, eight, or nine in, you're like, well, what can I do that's different? Where can I take this character not only where Fleming has and and where I haven't? So you get Bond versus a serial killer. You know, it's he at a certain point said, I'm going to even stop trying to emulate Fleming and I'm just going to follow my own muse. At least that's what I think. Bill Bryan? Just with, with respect, though, with the later novels with Garner, and if it stopped at six, you wouldn't have gotten characters like, was it Beatrice, who I thought was maybe the best female character outside of Fleming in, in all these years. Um, and, 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 yeah, and also, you know, even like The Man from Barbarossa, that book the, is so different than the rest of his novels. It, it, exposition, exposition, exposition. But at the end, it came off re really well. So, you know, maybe, I don't know. I, 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 and, 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 if he, and if he had stopped with, with, say, six books, then what would have happened then? We wouldn't necessarily have had those books to fill the gap between, you know, uh, licensed, I mean, the License to Kill and Goldeneye, which was, as a Bond fan, that was a Huge part of my my uh, my my upbringing, but, but what I experienced at the time. So, yeah. <laughs> and I think certainly Brian would feel poorer if Never Send Flowers wasn't in the world. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, no, that that was one of the. I, that was probably the only um, Gardner book I actually bought. Um, in Easton's, I think it was, uh, in 1998. I found it was actually still on the, the shelves. You know, just this, and it was quite. Sort of, I think I have it here. Maybe some quite sort of uh, a little bit beat up looking, um, uh, and it'd been sitting, you know, for about four years. It must have been sitting, or however many years it was there. Um, and I, I'd never, you know, I'd, I'd read some of his books, but I'd never heard of that one because there was, it wasn't on the internet and things. Um, and I, you know, I started to read it, and I thought it was really good. You know, the character Dragon Paul was was a very uh, strange, bizarre kind of villain, and um something really different and uh, as mark said you know as, as, as you've said that i think then whenever you you know you write one or two books or three or four um you, you can come up with ideas but then there's the danger of repeating yourself whenever you're you're limited to something like bond you can't sort of go off and uh you know you have to sort of keep trying to find new villains and then the cold war came to an end the berlin wall came down um so then what 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 do you do do you you know you, you know you can't 
keep going over having the Soviets and the Nazis as the villains. You have to kind of find new um, new ways of um, keeping keeping things going with, with new. So that's where the the idea of the, the serial killer and those sort of things came from, I think, or even the American right and cold. Um, you know the the, the the general British Clay, that character, that's another sort of attempt to to change things a bit and look at something else beyond, you know, neo Nazis or uh, you know, the the heirs of Smirsh or whatever. Um so I think that's why why he experimented more with those those later books because he had to kind of uh, there was less to, you know, uh draw on. Sort of the new world order. I suppose the the end of history they were talking about once the Berlin Wall came down, and obviously it wasn't the end of history, but it, it kind of looked that way for a while. That you know, um, what, what are the new threats that we need to be looking towards? And that's why some of these these books have these more experimental nature, I think. And then speaking of experimental, I mean, we had obviously the Raymond Benson books, which are fairly conventional Bond thrillers. We discussed that that balancing act that he had between the the film Bond and the literary Bond. But then post-2000, we've had all sorts from Ian Fleming publications. We've had spin-offs with Young Bond and Money Penny Diaries. We've had one-off books from authors and a trilogy from Anthony Horowitz. Uh, what do you think of this sort of broad range of stuff that that seems a little bit unfocused when you look at it as, as a Bond fan, maybe over the last 20 years? How do you feel the, the world of literary Bond has evolved in that time, Mark? Well, so, so what happened... So... Benson did six and they sort of took a pause on writing adult bond books, but when it becomes less exciting for the general public beyond the bond fans, and then you also get less press, but so they said, we're going to, we're going to think, we're going to rethink that. We're going to rethink our, our strategy of having one author do a whole run, but let's give people bond stories. So they did two things simultaneously. They did the young bond stories, that would eventually become five with Charlie Higson, and then they did the tr the trilogy of Money Penny Diaries. So these three diary Money Penny books and these four five Higson books were happening at, at the same time. They were happening concurrently, uh, and then after they after that we get to the hundred years of, of of we get to Fleming centenary, and this is when you see a change of strategy for IFP. You get the one celebrated author doing one book. And they start with, with Fox and, and Devil May Care writing as Ian Fleming. So Sebastian Fox was on this radio program slash game show where they would give the writer, a series of writers, an author and say, write in the style of. One, you know, write in the style of Agatha Christie, write in the style of Harold Pinter. Um, and one of those game shows was about Ian Fleming. So he had a little bit of practice writing the style of Ian Fleming. So they took, so they changed their approach where we're going to have one famous author, a, year, a, a, a book. So we, we've got Sebastian Fox, who, who is noted. We got Jeffrey Deaver, who's a big bestseller. And we have William Boyd, each writing just one book, each writing in a, in a way that sort of tickled their own sensibilities. So Deaver wanted to write a contemporary one. He felt that Ian Fleming's books were contemporary. His should be contemporary. Uh, and, and Boyd wanted to do a period where he had written a book that, you know, where his 50s books, his 40s book. He's like, oh, this is going to be my 60s book, my 1969 James Bond turns 45. And they were intending to continue on with this method of one author per book and they that's how anthony harwich started out with hit with his first book trigger mortis but I, I people really embraced it so they said uh, would you do one more and he did would you do one more and he did so the the, the change of strategy in, in that instance was more circumstantial where it was going well and he wanted to continue and they wanted to continue. So I think it's good that they're not too intractable in their strategy, that they can't respond to also what's going on out there. Yeah. And I've, I've also enjoyed that they've gone back to a contemporary James Bond adventure in the little novella now from Charlie Higson. 
because I felt like we've had a lot of period bond lately. I, I found it very refreshing to to go back to a to an up to date uh, story. Yeah, me too. And and what's so surprising about that is if you were to ask either the fans or Charlie Hickson, what would you like your next Bond after doing five re- well regarded young Bond novels? What would you like your next Bond book to be? You know, he would say the war years or, you know, something like that, or or an adult Bond period. He wouldn't have said a contemporary Bond novella. That wouldn't have been on anybody's list. But it turns out to be something that was unexpected, something that the fans didn't ask for or or think that they wanted, but was widely embraced. Now, not everyone loved it, um, I, but uh, it, as a general rule, the, the, the fans... Uh, embraced it, and I and I enjoyed seeing a contemporary Bond by Charlie Hickson, even though I didn't think I would, or I would want that rather, I should say. So, just as a as a quick way to wrap up, and maybe each person can throw out one or two titles. But what do you think are best places for for new readers to to start uh, with continuation novels? Uh, 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 ones that maybe are typical, maybe also ones that are a bit unique that people might find interesting. Do I start? <laughs> I would say start with Gardner and then read them all the way through and then and get to Benson because they are the Fleming, Gardner, Benson are like as far as that all one large continuity. After that, things go a little well, not sideways, but but that that that's what I would recommend. Start with License Renewed and go all the way through, and then start then go with the um, zero minus ten and and read those and read the novelizations in order too with, with, within that time period. Brian, what about you? Yeah, well, I, I would sort of agree with that, but I would start with Colonel Sun uh, by Kingsley Amos or Robert Markham. Um, uh, I'd start there first because that really is the, the first one as well. There was the 003 book, but that's really the first um, proper adult continuation novel, and I think it's the best written, um, and it's probably the most like Fleming, and it's set. It's actually written in the in the 60s, so it has a a genuine feel to it and, and it's he's a great villain and the opening sequence is, is great and the, the torture scene is great and that's sort of bookended by those two. And then I would move on to, to Gardner then, uh, or you could read the Christopher Wood novelizations as well if you wanted to, I suppose. Uh, but I would go on to Gardner and you, you could start with License Renewed, you know, for Special Service Icebreaker, those first three and see if you, you like those and continue on then if you want to. Um, and obviously Scorpius and Never Send Flowers and Cold would be other books that I think are, are, are the best of Gardner. And then probably continue on someone... to, to, to Benson to zero minus 10 and on from there. So. And for someone who's more of a cherry picker, Mark, what would you suggest? I, I, I would respectfully agree with, with, with Bill and Brian about the merits of reading it in order. I I think what happens is they're in some ways they're not meant to be read in order, uh, particularly the Gardner because when you do read sixteen works of somebody one after another, you do see a little bit more of the tricks that they they return to. I recommend that you jump around. I mean, by all means, read Amos and Colonel Son, and by all means, read John Gardner's. Uh, license renewed. By all means, read that. I mean, they're they're a lot of fun. But I'm 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 advocating jumping around. You know, B- Benson's do, do have an arc, me- meaning they 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 kind of should be read in order. But if you did start with one, you're not going to be lost. If you jump into High Time to Kill, which is a a very exciting, fast paced, interesting mountain climbing themed novel you're going to be okay um you'll get more out of it if if you read the his his quote unquote union trilogy in order but you can b- jump around you can jump into the you know read the first you should probably read the first of each thing so read mm-hmm. the first charlie higgs and young bond read the first uh money penny diaries uh with anthony horowitz you don't have to go in publication order you don't have to read trigger mortis first you can read, um, and you might, it might be actually better to read it this way. You could read forever in a day first, then, then, then go to a uh, trigger mortis and with the mind to kill. 
because you do see an arc for James Bond if you read them that way. So jump around. Right. Yeah, I, I, I also would agree. Jumping around is, is a good approach to them. And, and I found them all in, a, in strange orders and found uh, things to enjoy in all of the books, uh, no matter where you're coming uh, to them from. Uh, I think each one has its merits. And I think Mark does a really good job of presenting that in his book, what the things are that, that the author does, what makes them interesting and unique. So yeah, definitely the, the book itself could be a great guide to to looking for what might interest you. Um, and I think, well, I, I'm very hopeful that it's going to help uh, a lot of uh, Spryberry listeners who've not delved into the continuation novels to maybe find a, a good starting point, something that ca- takes their interest. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's an excellent point. I mean, that was the hope is that you will get this book, James Bond after Fleming, and pick it up and poke around and go, you know what, I've never read that Bond novel. Let, let me give that a shot. Or alternatively, my hope is that someone will say, I read it. I didn't get that out of it. That seems like a, a worth, I sort of dismissed it or I didn't think about that. And, and Mark said that, and that seems like an okay point of view. Let me, let me give it another read and, and maybe I'll enjoy it or appreciate it more from, from that perspective. That's my hope. My hope is that more people read Bond books. Um, and I, I should add that I had not read all of them uh, before starting this book. It was the process of uh, reading, researching the book that fueled, that refueled this interest. And so I hope I share that with others. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of Bond continuation discussion on the Spybury Facebook group. And yeah, I'm sure as people read books, there's going to be lots of opinions going around. And yeah, it'll be really interesting to see where people come, come to these books from. Well, thank you, uh, Mark, uh, Bill and Brian for this really interesting discussion. I, I know we could we could probably carry on for a good, a good many hours discussing these books. And uh, yeah, as I say, there will be a lot of discussion, I'm sure, in future on this library group. Um, yeah, thanks very much, guys, for joining. Thank you for having us. We, uh, I really appreciate it. And, 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 and thanks to Shane and to you, to you, Matt, and Bill and Brian. Thank you. And to whoever's listening. Great. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>